great pleasure this evening to, to start a new terms series of evening lectures with a return by Stan Allen here at the AA. Stan is, is, uh, has been a frequent visitor in the past. He's been an external critic here, an examiner. He's looked at the work of our students. He's been a visiting critic in special events and workshops with us in different parts of the school and, of course, uh, a past lecturer here at the school. It's great that he's come back. I, we're trying to calculate it, I think, for the first time since about 1998. So we can welcome him back into the new century here. Um, Stan is someone, of course, who's played an incredible role in helping shape the terms <coughs> and the appearance of contemporary architectural discourses and practices over the last decade, 15 years, um, with an absolute and fundamental belief and conviction in the continual reanimation and reinvention of architectural thinking as we know it. I think one of the interesting things that Stan brings to that um, to that work is, is, is a remarkable belief and conviction in cross-disciplinarity as a part of that conversation in architecture today. I think Stan's work um, as an architect and in architecture is um, fully invested in architecture and the way in which it's changed and transformed through its alignments with things like infrastructure, urbanism, the landscape, large-scale planning, and disciplines that are often thought of as separate from and distinct from architecture as we think it, um, but that nonetheless are crossing over in new and unexpected ways uh, in recent years. Stan's writings and projects relate not just something like architecture and urbanism or architecture and infrastructure, but as well are often written through correspondences between things like architecture and art, contemporary art practices. Um, his essays on things like field space or the contemporary discourse of the diagram are continually informed uh, and illustrated through examples taken from a number of different disciplines and fields, forms of practice. Uh, his writings on notation and diagrams particularly played a really key role in the whole discussion about what a diagram uh, might be today in a discourse like architecture, his essay, um, Diagrams Matter, written about the time he was here in 1998, um, still remains one of the really central statements uh, around the, current, the contemporary discussion of the diagram. And one of the great points he makes in the essay is, <coughs> is that whatever a diagrammatic architecture or a diagram architecture is, it's something other than just an architecture produced through diagrams. Um, and that there's, in fact, a much more complex relation between those kind of <coughs> concepts and what we think of as the architectural object today. Stan is, of course, an architect. He is the dean of the School of Architecture at Princeton University, um, which is one of the key centers of architectural discussion, debate, and education in the United States today. Um, Stan came, came to that job a couple of years ago from Columbia University, where he was for about 13 years uh, in New York as the director of the advanced design program there. In recent years, his projects have included galleries, um, prototype houses, uh, and other projects in the United States, in Puerto Rico, a project in Korea, um, and several other countries. Uh, a prototype house is currently under construction in Sagaponic, uh, New York, um, that was designed a few years ago. Uh, and alongside those kind of works within his practice, um, of course, many of you will know him through his writings as theoretical experimental writings um, collected a few years ago in a book called Practice, Architecture, Technique, and Representation, which includes essays on, on uh, architectural notation and representation. Um, and the, his, the collection, the early collection of work from his studio is included in Points and Lines, uh, Diagrams and Projects for the City, published in 1999, which includes essays by Michael Hayes, Bob Somal, and some others. Um, Stan has been the recipient of many awards in the United States and elsewhere that have supported and um, developed lines of his thinking. Um, and it's an absolute pleasure to welcome him back to the AA. Stan Allen.
I'm doing my best here. How's that? All right, I, I will do my best not to exclude this side of the auditorium here. Um, I, I do like to be able to move around and, and see the slides while I talk, so you'll, you'll have to forgive me a little bit here. Um, the AA is one of a few places around the world where uh, you, you feel when you're talking here that you're really sharing information and ideas with your friends and your colleagues rather than sort of performing for a bunch of strangers. Um, and uh, I feel that conversation is very important. It's very important that places like the AA exist where that uh, conversation can take place because it's part of the way that, that we move the discipline uh, forward. So, so it's a great pleasure to be here. It's, it's great to be in this context and uh, to get, uh, I didn't realize was starting off your new term. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm glad to see the lights are down already. Um, my lecture is almost entirely image driven. Um, so I don't have any prepared text. Um, I think it's important as architects that we're able to communicate our ideas through the, through the projects and uh, through the images uh, themselves. Uh, as usual, I have too many images, so I will try and go quickly, uh, and uh, let's hope there's some time for some discussion afterwards. Now, let me, s yeah, perfect. So, uh, all right, well, the title of the lecture uh, is Strategies and Tactics. I'll come to that in a minute. And I'm also given it this subtitle, Objects and Fields. Um, uh, part of that thinking has to do with the idea that these two images, which would seem to be from different realms, are actually really quite similar. This is an aerial photograph of the American West taken by the photographer Alex McLean. Um, and this is uh, Andreas Gursky's photograph of Los Angeles. Now, the geometries and configurations of this landscape that are based on certain infrastructural systems, certain topographies, <laughs> configurations that are sort of embedded in this landscape determine the way this landscape works and the way this landscape uh, looks. Uh, in many senses, something very similar is going on here. There are a whole series of embedded patterns and infrastructures, patterns of settlement, patterns of movement uh, that create this kind of extended field uh, that allow us to, to borrow some of the tools of uh, landscape architecture, of ecology and so on as a means of studying uh, this, uh, this kind of city. Now, the other reason for this comparison is that I think increasingly in the 21st century, if we're going to think seriously about cities and we're going to think seriously about urbanism, we're more likely going to be dealing with cities like this. Extended, porous, horizontal fields uh, rather than the kind of dense, compact, traditional city. Now, uh, the image on the top here is a kind of map of our practice that we use on our website. Um, and I'd also like to suggest that these two images share, share something. Uh, we present architecture here in a kind of web of uh, other references, urbanism, ecology, infrastructure, and so on, including the sort of written uh, speculations uh, that, that are also uh, part of my practice. Um, but architecture does hold the central place in this diagram, uh, but the, uh, the, the lines and the arrows go both directions, and I think that's... Uh, that's, that's very important. Now, this, of course, is a cloverleaf interchange. Uh, and it's often seen as a kind of diagram of mixing and exchange. Um, and, I and that's certainly true. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's an infrastructural device that allows a certain communication between the different highways and, and so on. But it's also a device of separation. Uh, in fact, the, the, the reason it works is the slight sectional separation of the different roadways. So I, I think it's important to pay attention both to the mixing, but uh, also to the separation that occurs in these larger kind of webs of interdisciplinary uh, uh, information and knowledge. So strategies and tactics. Um, I was motivated to think about this issue um, for a couple of reasons. 
Um, I gave a lecture at Columbia shortly after I took over the deanship at, at, at Princeton. And uh, after the lecture, Bernard Schumi asked me a question. Um, he pointed out correctly that in the 90s, I would often present my work by talking about uh, it as a kind of tactical practice. One of the chapters in Points and Lines, for example, is called um, uh, Contextual Tactics. Uh, whereas in this period, in the, in the uh, beginning uh, um, around 2000, 2001, uh, when I was working in collaboration with the landscape architect James Corner, uh, we were working on very large projects and we were, we were talking a lot about strategy and Bernard quite properly asked, you know, what's, what's up with this, with this switch? Is it simply a matter of having to deal with larger projects, with real projects that you make this move from uh, tactics to strategy? So it got me thinking a little bit and, and it motivated me to go back and uh, think about that distinction a little bit. Um, the other thing has to do with just sort of making sense of my current uh, practice. Um, I've been practicing architecture since the uh, early 1990s. Um, and in 1999, uh, James Corner and I formed a partnership uh, called Field Operations, a uh, partnership between a landscape architect and an architect uh, that was devoted to large scale projects primarily based in urbanism and uh, landscape and infrastructure. Um, and that, of course, coincided shortly after uh, with the period when I took the deanship at, uh, at, at Princeton. And um, for various reasons, uh, Jim Corner and I are now working separately, although we continue to collaborate on a number of projects. Uh, and I've opened an office in Princeton less than a year ago now. And we have quite intentionally, in this new office, uh, taken on work at all different scales. I think it's very important for an architect to work at different scales and at different speeds. Uh, one of the things when you commit to these big projects, you commit to a very long uh, time of realization and implementation. Uh, so I think it's important to keep the practice fresh that you're always working uh, at different speeds things that have a very quick duration and things that are much more, uh, much with a much longer time horizon. Hence, there's a lot of different stuff going on in the office and you will see tonight the sort of range of scales from tiny pavilions to very large landscapes. So again, one useful way of thinking about uh, that mix is, is to go back to this old distinction between strategies and tactics. It comes, of course, from, from uh, the military. And uh, as I think uh, has been pretty well uh, theorized elsewhere, uh, you could think of strategy as action that is planned out in advance and planned out at a distance from the site where that action takes place. Now this, is, of course, describes what architects do quite directly. Uh, we plan in advance and we plan in a site which is distinct from the building site, from the field where that uh, action takes uh, place. Um, strategy is invested in predictability. Uh, strategy is more devoted to rules and systems. Um, it, uh, if you, you, you uh, Michel Deserteau has ca characterized tactics as the art of the weak. Uh, if strategy is devoted to winning and then holding ter territory, uh, tactics are the province of those who don't have territory to hold and protect, but instead move in a kind of mobile way under and beneath the radar, beneath that, that sort of panoptic radar of the strategic uh, power base. So tactics belongs to weakness, to lack of power. Strategy belongs to power, to gaining and holding territory. and let's say, to mapping out and marking the boundaries of that uh, uh, territory. The other important distinction is that if uh, strategy is mapped out primarily in space, um, tactics has to do with the clever use of time. Uh, it's, in the sen that sense, improvisational. It's based on nearness and proximity. Uh, I would suggest that the map belongs to the world of 
strategy. The diagram belongs to the world of tactics. Um, strategy is based on uh, sight and surveillance, uh, keeping the enemy within your field of vision, whereas tactics works below uh, the, 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 the field of the enemy's uh, uh, vision. So now, here's the, here's the dilemma in a way, right? Um, we're all sort of good readers of cultural theory and so on, and we, we tend to be much more attracted to this side of the diagram. Uh, we'd much rather be improvisational than calculating. Uh, however, in almost every instance, architecture is much more committed to that side of the diagram. So uh, the, the, the question, I think, uh, comes up, how, uh, how can we get out of this kind of double bind? And you know, is it simply enough to say that we should try and make practice more tactical? I'd like to, th I'd like to think that at one level, um, architecture is so committed to the strategic precisely because architectural practice is so necessarily circumstantial. Uh, that is to say, architects don't determine their own sort of research project or creative project. We respond to commissions, to competitions, to clients, and so on. And somehow, we've fallen back on this, this uh, much more rigid uh, uh, compromise with strategy precisely because, in a certain sense, all we ever do is improvise. So it seems to me it may be possible to formulate this distinction in more interesting ways. Just to give a couple of quick examples from our practice, um, this is, I would suggest, a paradigmatic uh, strategic uh, document. This is uh, uh, something from the uh, 2001 uh, competition for the Freshfields Landfill that I did with Jim Corner. And uh, this was part of the necessary documentation in the competition to think through the long process of implementation and to map out the different stages, to define what had to happen first, how these different uh, operations were related to one another. Now, two years into the project, uh, into the actual master planning project with a contract from the city of New York, I can tell you none of this is going this way at all. Uh, it bears no relationship to the current project. Uh, but we couldn't have gotten to where we are without this. So there's something about that need to be, at one level, totally convinced, and on the other hand, always ready to revise that, that I think is fundamental to architectural practice. Uh, now, the building site, in the best of senses, should be a place of improvisation. Building codes and, and rules and regulations tend to work against that, but uh, there is, I think, at least the potential for a kind of zone of improvisation at the, at the building site. This is a, a, a shot of the Sagaponic House that, uh, that Brett mentioned under construction. The plans, by the way, are here, rolled up, <laughs> not, uh, not very often consulted by the builders, I, I have to say, in this particular case. Um, but uh, you know, uh, th th there, there is, I think, again, a, a, an area potentially opened up there. Uh, on the right, um, a project I'm not going to show in detail because it's really very new, but um, we're involved in a project uh, to build emergency housing for uh, hurricane victims in, uh, not in Louisiana, but in Florida. And uh, we have a client who um, is asking us to build uh, 600 houses, uh, prefabricated houses, at $23 a square foot. I don't know what that translates to in pounds, but trust me, it's really cheap. <laughs> and uh, we have no experience in prefabricated housing. We're, we're making it up as we go along. Uh, and it's something that I think architectural offices should be prepared to do, to react quickly and to deal with the unexpected in, 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 in this way. So uh, it seems to me that it is possible to rethink some of this oppositional character of strategy and tactics uh, to get out of that kind of oppositional character of the two to think about the way in which you can put calculation and improvisation together to, to, to imagine a more agile form of practice, to manage the uncertainty of the process of implementation through uh, notions of adaptation, to get out of the, the opposition of knowledge and intuition by, by appealing to a notion of, of know-how, of the sort of 
expertise of the architect, the kind of informal exchange of knowledge and information that happens in the sort of day-to-day -day exercise of practice, uh, and so on. Distance and nearness through the notion of the loose fit, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more through the specific projects about this notion of locality and iconicity. So, uh, all right. Um, I'm going to show about a dozen projects and um, the, some of these notions get deployed, of course, differently in different projects. So uh, without tracing all of the arrows through in the diagram, uh, I would just suggest two things. One is that in any given project, there are always multiple concepts at work. There's never a single overriding concept. Uh, and that, for example, in the houses, you don't see the arrow connecting so much to landscape and topography, for example. Uh, although a lot of the arrows do uh, uh, converge around this notion of uh, diagrammatic. So I'm going to start with the houses uh, partly in the, the sense of moving and ascending scale, um, but also for the sort of pleasure of beginning with some, some built projects. Um, this is a project uh, built in Los Angeles uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the client was an artist, a, a painter, uh, and she owned this large uh, warehouse here and had um, an open uh, lot uh, next door where she proposed building a, a, a house and would, would retain this for her studio. Now, of course, it's a, it's a wonderful sort of paradigmatic uh, Los Angeles site, the Southern Pacific Railway running here, Commercial Boulevard here. Uh, beginning from the corner, this is a produce warehouse. This is an existing single family house. Uh, and this is a Russian Seventh-day Adventist church. So any notion of coherent context goes out the window right away, uh, which, of course, makes it a, a, a very interesting site to work on. Here's the house sort of nestled in there. Uh, in this sort of larger Los Angeles context, in the flat part of Glendale, not in the hills. Um, and this is the uh, side of the house that faces this alley of palm trees in what is, though, in fact, a very modest uh, residential uh, neighborhood. So in part, the house had to do with negotiating these different scales uh, and also with negotiating these different characters. The residential character on the one side and then that kind of tough industrial character on the other side. Now, despite a fairly open lot, there was a quite restricted building envelope available, which forced us initially into, uh, be because the footprint was compressed, it, it, it mandated a certain complexity in section. So the, the diagram of the house is this notion of a shell that's folded around itself that creates a kind of gap here into which we slot certain volumes that are, are, are designated for particular programs, the garage, the guest house, and uh, so on. So that in the built project, you can see the uh, trace of that uh, envelope here, and then the little piece here, in this case for the guest house, that's slotted in underneath. And you see the way in which also the materials of the house, which are generally monochromatic, <coughs> but they kind, of, they kind of code that organizational diagram. That is to say that the uh, the uh, aluminum uh, of the envelope that wraps right into the inside of the house, uh, the corrugated fiberglass for the pieces that are slotted in, and then the uh, stucco as a kind of infill at the end of this sectional uh, diagram. Now, if the initial idea of the house developed in section, of course, a lot of the, 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 the working out of it happens in, in the plan dimension. Uh, the, the, the angle given by an existing opening that, that, that couldn't be moved uh, for the garage that opens up this little slot here where you enter, you come into a big double height space and then just very simple kitchen and uh, guest room here. Uh, the double height space here, you see the sort of close proximity to the site and the way the, in a typical Southern California way, the landscape is brought into the house. Uh, and then upstairs, a very simple suite of uh, study, bathroom, and bedroom. Uh, best view in the house is the bathroom uh, here on the second floor. So uh, just another view of that uh, ground floor space. Uh, the south and west face, which again uh, partly is reflecting the kind of toughness of the uh, neighborhood with the industrial materials. And then this side, which uh, opens up, and this is the pathway to the studio here. 
Um, and given, again, the kind of compression of the site, um, there were a whole series of, let's say, sort of openings and filters in the house, both for, for framing views and letting the light into the house and marking your passage sort of through the house uh, and that close proximity of the different materials and the kind of detailed transitions uh, within the house. Here, the exterior skin, those different materials. This is the same skin wrapped into the main living spaces of the building. And the idea that one of the things that links the large scale projects with the small scale projects is the articulation of these zones of transition, uh, the sort of spaces in between uh, that, 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 that form a point of, uh, of, of, of commonality between these very large scale projects and the smaller scale uh, projects. Um, just a very quick view of a uh, we're, we're now working on the landscape between the house and the studio and building a small uh, pavilion for the same client. Um, this is another uh, house built in upstate New York, uh, roughly the same time, but a very different site. And as you can see, a, a, a kind of wooded uh, natural uh, site. And here, in the absence of contextual clues, Working through a principle of what I call default regularity, if there's no strong s pressure to the contrary, it seems logical to make the, the form very simple. Uh, so it is basically a simple box, but then the box is lightly tweaked to open it up to views and to um, light on the, s on the site. So uh, again, here is the plan of the house, very simple, uh, straightforward plan, almost loft-like with a a kind, of, a kind of service core in the middle, allowing uh, that sort of open circulation around the house kind of sitting as an object in the landscape, but because of the fall of the site, allowing to kind of open up uh, and cantilever on one side, and then we bring the, the, the landscape uh, uh, more into the site. We, we, we managed to make out of um, cedar and um, uh, marine plywood, a very good imitation of corrugated metal uh, on this, in this case. Uh, here's a view of the site and you can see that, that, that slight tweaking of the volume uh, as it opens up towards uh, the site and the view. We're doing a small addition to this house as well. Um, uh, and it consists in part in a, in a kind of uh, landscape pavilion and uh, pool, again, stepping further down the site, taking advantage of the fall of the site. Uh, this house is for an artist as well. She's an artist who, who does not paint with natural light and specifically asked for no natural light in her studio. Hence, we've worked the studio into the fall of the site and used the upper level uh, to create this um, pool pavilion. So. Um, the third of these house projects that I'm showing is the Sagaponic house that Brent mentioned. Uh, for those of you who don't know the, hist the history of this project, it's an interesting story. It's a developer who, back in the late 1980s, bought a big piece of property in, uh, in the Hamptons um, on the wrong side of the highway in the Hamptons, if uh, that means anything to anyone. But um, he uh, sat on the property, which was broken up as a typical suburban development, and starting in the late 1990s, uh, got together with the advice of Richard Meyer, a group of about 35 architects, um, to build single family houses speculatively uh, without specific clients on, this, uh, on these lots. So they are quite typical. That's about a two acre lot. Uh, it's re somewhat big for, by suburban standards, but we are basically talking about a, a, a kind of suburban configuration here with then a series of these highly designed objects. Now, we, uh, th the interesting thing about this project is that, that people were invited that ranged from people like Richard Meyer, Stephen Hall, and Richard Rogers uh, to younger people like myself, Lindy Roy, Jesse Reiser, and so on. Now, as it happened, it was the younger people who kind of jumped on this project and got the drawings finished uh, and uh, you know, in a sense, we're sort of hungry to get something built. Um, and as a consequence, the, the five or so houses that are under construction now, including houses by Shigeru Ban and uh, Hawkins and Smith Miller and so on, tend to be the, the, uh, from the younger architects, although Harry Cobb, who 
in 40 years of practice with Paycob Freed, had never designed a house, actually has also just finished a house out there. So um, now, however, uh, we, uh, I think, were one of the few architects who actually took the original brief fairly seriously. Uh, that is to say, it asked for houses that were modest by, uh, by Hampton standards. Uh, it asked for houses that, that had some relationship to the sort of local vernacular traditions. And there was this funny line in the original letter sent to the architects that asked for more or less traditional roof lines. I think that was a code word for no flat roofs. Um, but it seemed like an interesting challenge to us. So uh, this is the site and uh, the, 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 the way the house sits on the site. But we really took that notion of more or less traditional roofs to heart and thought we could do something with the idea of a very active roof line. In a sense, uh, thinking about the iconicity of the house and, and the strong, in a sense, kind of emotional charge that the house carries. Uh, and by working with this kind of inverted pitched roof that's developed into these large skylights and high uh, double height spaces, we could, we could turn that into the primary design gesture of the house uh, so that there are moments where it looks like a traditional pitched roof and a, even a traditional uh, chimney here. But then, as you see, uh, I can't go backwards. Probably just as well. We'll keep moving forward. So. Um, we don't want to slow things down here. Uh, here, you, you see in the main living space uh, what's, what's essentially a triple height space, and then this connection through to that pavilion that sits uh, over there. The other thing that was important to us in this particular house was to think about this notion of a kind of anonymous client and to make the house, in a sense, somewhat generic uh, and to create spaces that could be appropriated for uh, potentially many different uh, uh, uses. Uh, in particular, uh, the spaces on this side of the house that could be used either as a studio or a music room or as an extra bedroom were an important uh, component of that. So this is the elevation of the project that is being built. Um, and uh, we were intentionally looking for this big kind of simple volumetric uh, uh, object, uh, almost really something kind of barn-like. But then, for example, these, these, the height of these skylights is used to create a large truss to span those spaces uh, so that, that there would be different levels uh, uh, going on there. Uh, another shot of the building under construction of that, that kind of very austere face that it presents uh, to the road. Uh, this is that uh, uh, space designed uh, uh, for potentially multiple uses. And here, a shot of the interior. Uh, these are rather old, um, as you can see from the taken uh, early fall, late summer. Uh, every time I go out there, it seems to be very gray and uh, haven't been able to get more recent shots. Well, if this is a landscape that I'm somewhat familiar with, um, this is not, uh, which is one of the reasons why we start with this, with this map here. Um, uh, this is a project we're designing for a house in the Philippines. Um, the, um, it's a, um, a country house for a, a couple who live in Hong Kong, a uh, vacation house. Uh, and it's outside of Manila on a kind of peninsula on the water. Um, now, it looks as if this diagram is intending to show that the typhoons always miss the Philippines, which is not the case, happened to be the case in, in 2004. But uh, the, the, the point here is it, it is a fairly extreme uh, environment. Uh, it's a it's, uh, high seismic area. Uh, you get torrential rains. You get typhoon power uh, winds. Uh, and of course, it's, it's very hot and uh, muggy. Uh, the, the, again, the lots here are quite small, almost suburban in, in size and character. Uh, but the, uh, the, the view uh, is, is quite spectacular. The site has a very steep drop and a very restricted footprint. Uh, and that's been really very fundamental in uh, the design of the house itself. You can see the 
steepness of that and, and a bit the kind of character of some of the houses that are uh, on the site uh, at present. Uh, so our project has, on the one hand, been a kind of reworking of the site itself to create a series of occupiable terraces that step down the hill uh, and to organize the main living spaces uh, within that uh, and then to create a more sculptural object that has to do with the uh, orientation of the bedrooms for uh, views and privacy on the upper levels here and from the entry level here, little garage carport here, will create a kind of, a kind of artificial landscape uh, of the roofs. Uh, nobody's ever done a green roof in the Philippines. We're going to try. There may be good reasons for that. We may find out why that is. So in, in slightly more detail, this is the state of the project uh, right now. Uh, you, you, you enter down these stairs. The main living spaces are a big open loft-like space at this level. The bedrooms with their sort of pinwheeling form for the views and the privacy here. And then this kind of roof landscape that in fact coincides with the entry level. Uh, the plan of that bedroom level, entry and the garage and street here. Uh, the view uh, from uh, the ocean and a shot of the, the, the kind of working uh, study model that shows that, the, again, the kind of active, iconic uh, roof line. Uh, again, the, the skylights having some relationship to the kind of, kind of traditional uh, uh, images of the roof uh, without being literal about it. Um, and here, a, a view of, of at least a provisional uh, thinking about uh, some of the materials. Uh, one of the things about the Philippines is that um, it's just the opposite of, of the U.S. Uh, anything that's labor intensive is cheap, so stonework and woodwork is cheap. Anything that's, that's technological is um, expensive, so uh, uh, there's a very kind of, kind of low-tech attitude towards the materials in this building. Another unfamiliar landscape, again, this is part of what architects have to deal with in practice today is you're constantly working in places um, that are unfamiliar to you. Uh, this is a, a um, new town uh, called Paju Book City, developed and actually now built out to a great deal um, for the book publishing industry north of Seoul, Korea. And uh, we were invited to do a project there uh, in, gosh, maybe about five years ago. The project has been on hold for a long time, but has recently come back to life. Another, another thing that architects have to deal with all the time. Um, this is the original master plan done by the Korean architect H. Sang uh, Sung, and um, actually somebody from London, Florian Bagel. Um, and uh, it uh, was conceived as what the planners and architects described as an urban wetland. Uh, and uh, you can see both the sort of major uh, river flowing through here, the softness of the banks, but also there are a whole series of green corridors linking that together. Uh, and then these were conceived of as working villas for publishing houses uh, along a kind of boulevard. We were given this site here at the end of this uh, boulevard. And there was a fairly strict uh, typology uh, put in place. That's actually the, the project that Florian Bagel did. I believe it's actually built now. This was the state of the project about five years ago um, when, for a number of reasons, our project uh, came to a halt. Um, one of which was we had, in fact, violated the envelope of the typology that had been uh, given to us. Um, uh, this, we thought we were getting away with it by, by, by keeping this level very open. But uh, in fact, um, we were asked by the organizers to push this level down to that level. The other thing, though, um, that affected our thinking, this is our project dropped into a site model. And you can see there are many other, other projects being developed at the same time. It, it also occurred to us that there seemed to be a lot of, in a sense, to, to our eyes, sort of over-articulated uh, projects. And that, in a way, it, 
it called for a more restrained uh, response uh, to the site. Well, subsequent to that stage, uh, as I said, a lot of it has been built out. Um, foreign architects, such as foreign office architects, uh, um, Kazuo Sejima, Sejima Nishizawa, have built something there. Uh, the Spanish architect Vincente Gallart has built something, as well as a number of Korean architects. And uh, just in the last uh, two or three months, uh, this pro we've been asked to come back to this project now for a new client. Um, so our first thing was to deal with that, this zoning issue. So if this was the given zoning envelope, we said, well, OK, we'll work with that. But we're going to split it in half. We're going to rotate one piece. And that will give us this configuration here. Uh, respects all the, all the constraints of that original zoning envelope but gives us something which A, works better for the program, and B, we feel is a better termination uh, for this boulevard. Here you can see the, the kind of given uh, zoning envelope and the kind of green corridor here. Um, now, what I think was important about this decision is once that decision was arrived at, the rest of the project became a question simply of articulating that given envelope, that given volume, and looking at different ways to penetrate and different sort of patterns on the surface of that envelope. Uh, and then the organization of the program uh, within that uh, uh, given envelope. Um, all of these programs were quite interesting. They all included living, production work, office work uh, in, in an interesting uh, uh, mixture here. So uh, these are some of the first diagrams simply uh, talking about the kind of interlock of these programs within uh, the given uh, volume. And then working with the kind of gaps between those volumes and the given volume of the program and articulating those as kind of windows and view portals, wrapping the circulation around the outside, uh, as you can see in these plans. So this is the current state of the project. Uh, here's the, here's the, the d more developed section where the double height workspace is here, the office level here, and then connecting to these different uh, living quarters uh, here. Uh, but a lot of our, our thinking and effort now is in uh, thinking about the surfaces and the patterns uh, that would potentially be, uh, now I've discovered how to go backwards, now we're in trouble, um, on the facade of that building. Again, the the kind of interplay between what I think is a productive interplay between the sort of graphic and the tectonic in, in potentially in projects uh, like this. Well, um, the major part of my work and thinking in the past um, five to six years has been around questions of landscape infrastructure and urbanism. And I guess the other point to be made about the strategy and tactics uh, opposition is it's not enough simply to, let's say, prefer the tactical over the strategic. You have to say specifically what those tactics are. And for me, the, th the three important lessons that architects and urban designers can learn from landscape uh, have less to do with, let's say, the presence of vegetation and green stuff in, in the landscape, but are really more organizational and procedural. First has to do with the question of the surface, right? That is to say that surface, the extended horizontal surface, is the traditional domain of landscape. And it's the territory, I, I think, in recent practice, probably going back a, a dozen years now, where architecture and landscape have had a very kind of productive exchange around the notion of a kind of organizing surfaces as a means of creating spaces and activating a uh, program. Well, I've talked about this notion of the thick 2D, that is to say, a section that's made by folding or by weaving as opposed to simply stacking. Uh, the second, of course, I, I think the most important lesson that architects and urbanists can learn from uh, landscape has to do with process. Uh, that landscapes necessarily grow in and change over time and by appealing to this notion of an artificial ecology, to thinking about architecture and urbanism as a kind of artificial ecology that can be managed and will, it will grow and change and adapt and work through, through feedback and evolution, seems to me to be a very useful tool in thinking about uh, uh, cities and landscapes. 
And finally, the notion that um, one of the things that landscape does very well is to create zones and precincts without strict architectural demarcation. In other words, you, you can create sort of blurred overlapping zones of habitation and occupation through the deployment of landscape techniques in ways that have been, I think, very attractive to, to architects in the last um, half a dozen, dozen years. Uh, none of this is terribly new. It's, it's, it's really entered uh, certainly the architectural discourse and, and of course None of this is news here at the AA, where you actually have a landscape urbanism pro uh, uh, program. Um, I'm going to show a few of these projects. Um, and I'm going to show, actually, the Downs View project in some detail, because it was really in the project for Downs View, the competition for Park Downs View in Toronto, that Jim Corner and I really first worked out a lot of these issues. Uh, this uh, project was 99 through 2000. Uh, we were shortlisted on an international competition uh, that included OMA, Bernard Schumi, uh, foreign office architects. Uh, we were certainly at that point the least well-known uh, uh, people working in, on the competition and uh, really used it as the occasion to develop a kind of working methodology that has, I believe, served both, both of us well in, in the years to come. This, of course, is Toronto, uh, Lake Ontario. The, the sort of sort of center of Toronto. Toronto is a city that has a, uh, a density roughly similar to that of Los Angeles. It's an extended, again, extended open horizontal uh, field. Our site was somewhere up here, quite a distance from, from there. It was an abandoned uh, Canadian Forces base. base um, although this particular runway uh, was going to remain in operation for the uh, Bombardier de Havilland factory for testing and delivery of aircraft. So the competition consisted in the reuse of this roughly 400 acre parcel where uh, the barracks and facilities of the, of the base had been. And you can still see the, the, the traces of that in the landscape. Of course it is a uh, big kind of extensive open landscape in Toronto. You actually do feel almost as if you're right on the edge of the Great Plains, sort of big skies. Uh, it, it, it is an expansive open landscape. It's one of the real attractive characters of that landscape. The site was bisected by railroad tracks. Again, the sort of tracks going off to infinity. Um, and this um, was the high, I this is actually one of the highest points in Toronto. It means it's about 30 feet higher than anything else. Um, but that was significant because it's the dividing line of, uh, of two important watersheds. There were some very uh, spectacular pieces of architecture on the site, these old uh, hangar buildings, uh, including this storage depot built at the height of the Cold War um, and designed to withstand a nuclear blast. Um, makes it very hard to demolish. So one of the problems with the competition was to think of something to do in this building. Uh, I love this coating system on the ceiling that, that you know located the boxes of toilet paper and Kleenex uh, that were arrayed on the, on the floor. Uh, when we visited it, it had uh, strictly non-secret kind of material. Um, well, this is one of the diagrams that served to introduce the project, uh, locating the site here. And you see uh, at the point where these two watersheds divide. That's important not only from a kind of ecological perspective, but also because those uh, watersheds uh, tend to form kind of green recreational spaces with bike, biking trails and so on that are an important uh, recreational space for the city of uh, Toronto. Now, I'd written articles about field conditions. Um, we were practicing together as field operations. Uh, Jim had talked a lot about the field. So, of course, our first diagrams were field-like. Um, that is to say, sort of all over patterns grafted onto the site in which we then started thinking about how we might work with the program on the site. Now, also a bit of polemic in showing these early sketches because the winning uh, project by uh, Bruce Mao and OMA is a kind of all over pattern strategy. And we felt very quickly, having tested that strategy, that it didn't really work on this site. And one of the things we started to do was to look at the persistence within 19th and early 20th century parks of the ring road. Um, 
And we realized there's a reason for this persistence. It's actually a very useful s solution to some of the movement and circulation problems, and, and in a sense, also the kind of identity of, of uh, a big open park space. What we didn't like was the way in which the secondary roads would tend to sort of partition off the space. And we also didn't like the kind of casual relationship between the ring road and uh, the programmatic elements. So we proposed, in a sense, a kind of super ring road, uh, a kind of thick circuit of programs, which would, on the one hand, be the primary circulation, but it would also consolidate all of the active programs of the site into one continuous uh, active uh, strip. So that became one primary working strategy in the project. But the other thing was that if, if, if you think about ecology in any serious way, the first thing you realize about ecologies is ecologies don't respect boundaries. Ecologies are all about the interaction of large scale systems. So we needed another system that would go through and across this demarcated closed circuit system and that in the juxtaposition of those two systems, we would get a kind of rich working basis uh, for the project as it developed. So, so this is the diagram of the project, the circuit ecologies and the through flow ecologies and a photograph of the model where the, the development of those is, is mapped out a little bit and you can begin to see, for example, the drainage swales that are developed, the configuration of the circuit, uh, the, 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 the response to some of the density of the uh, existing architecture, and so on. So the primary circuit here is one of many, but it has a typical width of about 50 meters, um, but it does have a variable width. Um, so it can expand and contract uh, according to the potentially different functions that would be uh, developed along the length. So here, for example, where, where it creates a kind of earthwork that spans the track, it expands to a width of 150 meters to allow uh, sports events. The other thing is that it, in a sense, can sort of sample the local programs as it moves around the course of the uh, site, rather large site, so that it could take on a very different character here, adjacent to the kind of local suburban community, than in, let's say, the sort of depth of the site where it would be given over more to environmental education and so on. So for example, here, where it intersects uh, uh, that existing architecture, it becomes very densely programmed uh, for active uh, events and programs. Now, again, the through flow tends to move under and across that other system and allow both things like groundwater, local species. There was a, a whole discussion about, about uh, uh, coyotes moving through the site and so on, plant matter. All of these things get, that get distributed through and across the site, according, uh, including, of course, uh, the people who use the site. Uh, so you, you see some of that sort of axis and these lines of trees that are working their way through. It also gave us a very simple way of dealing with, with some of the pragmatic issues of the site, things like, like bike rental kiosks and restrooms and lighting that become a kind of scatter uh, throughout the uh, site. Um, now, one of the, uh, I think, more significant inventions of this particular project was this notion of the habitat uh, nests. Um, one of the real problems on the site was the degraded character of the soils, uh, that uh, the soils were very compacted and clay. One of the issues is to find a strategy to retain more of the uh, stormwater on site. Now, if you go to a uh, hydrologist, they will give you their typical solution, which is to create retention ponds. I'm sure anybody who's worked on site design has, has dealt with, these, uh, with, retain, with, with, with re, uh, retention ponds. Uh, retention pond can be very nice. I mean, it's a body of water, and it can be picturesque, and you can plant trees and so on, but uh, not very interesting. And, and also, on a site this small, would tend, in a sense, to sort of interrupt the kind of flows and patterns we were trying to establish on the site. So we proposed this idea of a kind of ridge and furrow landscape, uh, a kind of structured topography that would create zones of wetness and zones of dryness, but would allow people to move through and occupy uh, these zones of the site that, that would be uh, retaining uh, the water. And the other thing about these uh, habitat nests is that, the, again, like the circuit, they would take on different characters depending on where they were on the site. So that an upland nest 
uh, would have a completely different ecology than the lowland nests. Uh, and of course, they would change uh, over time as their ecology developed and, uh, and went through the, the, the various phases of, of succession. The architecture then, in turn, was designed to feed those nests so that uh, the, uh, we designed a series of big roofs to sort of catch water and then to channel it into those drainage swales that would create those nests that would create within this sort of vast open landscape uh, a, a, a different spatiality, a more sort of intimate uh, enclosed spatiality within spaces within uh, that uh, site. So these initial, I suppose you could again call them strategic decisions, then allowed us to work tactically to solve a number of projects, uh, prob problems as the site uh, developed o over time that we would in a sense kind of seed the site with various structural and uh, landscape propositions that through time and management would, would produce difference on this presently undifferentiated site uh, over time, where, where what could emerge is the coexistence of very sort of open naturalistic landscapes uh, and densely occupied uh, human landscapes such as this. Well, we didn't win that competition, um, and uh, in we, 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 we actually had the indignity of having our project ranked first by the technical jury and then not selected by the design jury. Uh, so we learned some things from that project, uh, and we, we did manage to win the competition for the Fresh Kills uh, <laughs> uh, landfill. I think, in, as I say, in large part due to some of the lessons we learned at, at, at Downsview. Uh, Fresh Kills Landfill, for those of you who don't know it, was established in the late 1940s by Robert Moses. Um, and since that time has been the repository of all of the garbage in the five boroughs of New York City. Uh, there are witty people who like to tell us that they've been contributing to our project for years. Um, the garbage uh, was piled up in what was then considered to be a swamp, now is considered a sensitive wetland that is deserving of restoration and protection and was piled up in, into these mounds, which are then covered with uh, geotextile membranes and um, two to three feet of, of crappy fill and then six to eight inches of uh, topsoil and then seeded uh, with various grasses. This is mound one and nine. Uh, the earlier mounds were closed. Uh, uh, this was closed in March of 2001 and I think as everybody knows, uh, reopened after September 11th for the World Trade Center debris. Uh, which then figured into the, into the uh, competition. Uh, these photographs were taken shortly before September 11th. This is Lower Manhattan up here. Um, it would have been impossible for Alex McLean to fly his small private airplane around to take those photographs after September 11th. Um, and, but the, the competition did play out in the uh, fall of 2001. We were selected as winners in early 2002, and there was a long process for negotiation. And about two years ago, um, Jim Corner's office uh, did receive the contract for the master plan, and uh, I'm continu continuing to collaborate with his office on the architectural uh, 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 part of the, of the uh, master plan. Uh, so I'm going to show the competition quickly. Um, and then give you a quick update about where the project is now. Um, I think one of the things that was important about our competition project, again, was this sort of larger regional thinking. Um, I mean, th there's a lot of components to this. Uh, Staten Island turns out to be a very important stopover in the flyway for mi migrating bird species. Um, but we wanted to identify the site as part of a larger network of green spaces on the island and to use the landfill project as a way of rethinking the identity of, of Staten Island, that when the landfill was taken out of its present industrial character, that Staten Island could be sort of reconceived as a kind of nature lifestyle island. Uh, and then that became a kind of programming strategy where we, we uh, uh, mapped out all of the existing uh, open space programs and then sort of sampled them uh, for the proposed program for uh, the new public park that would form the, the wetland. However, uh, I think 
most important and what triggers, in a sense, this sort of preoccupation with strategic thinking is the notion that there were incredibly complex pragmatic constraints on this, this project. Among them, what, what is described here, where everything in, in red and yellow is off limits to the public in the early stages uh, post-closure. Uh, so we had to conceive of a strategy that would be implemented over time to gradually introduce the public to the park, yet retain some sense of completion even in those uh, early uh, stages. So the, the, the constraints are listed over here. Uh, I'm not going to go through those in detail, only to suggest that um, this, what looks in many senses like a kind of um, natural hill is in fact a completely artificial construction. It's, it's mined for methane, it's got drainage swales that are mandated by the engineers, uh, these grasses are alien species, uh, despite the proximity to all this water, it's it, on the south and western slopes it's almost a desert l landscape because of the, of the dryness. So uh, it had to, uh, you, you, you simply couldn't imagine over this 3,200-acre uh, site a kind of typical landscape approach that would sort of propose an end state and then just implement it in stages. You had to think more of a strategy of kind of growing the project over time where you have a kind of initial seeding that will create difference uh, over time as the project uh, grows in. So you see here this kind of diagram of the very, the very light early touches and then the, 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 the denser web of functions that would happen over time. So again, uh, a, a series of three working strategies that are superimposed here, a kind of linear vocabulary of threads, threads of movement, threads of, 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 of energy, a, uh, a, a, a cluster vocabulary and a kind of work on the surfaces. And it's the combination of those three uh, that will create this kind of emergent uh, uh, matrix that will over time produce the, the kind of richness of uh, this, this landscape. Now in the early stages for the competition, the idea was that the architectural vocabulary would mirror that vocabulary of threads, clusters, and surfaces. So uh, one of the key elements was this uh, screen, which would be deployed both to protect the methane uh, flare stations uh, as well as to create spaces. So the, you can see here the way in the sort of earth berms for seeding or the screen that that linear vocabulary is sort of playing out uh, in the architecture uh, as well. Well. Um, it's a long, complicated process of implementation, and I just want to talk specifically about some of the architectural components, uh, a kind of quick update here. Uh, and a lot of it has been, in a sense, uh, uh, working with the client and, and, and writing the program for the, for the architecture. Uh, and although this diagram doesn't necessarily tell you that, one of the things that we've tried to avoid is the typical scatter of little pavilions and kiosks throughout the uh, park. So that all of the architectural interventions are always paired with very uh, specific landscape uh, proposals so that there's a kind of consolidation and concentration of the architectural elements uh, within the site. Um, and the other thing was to create a very, very simple typology uh, of elements, of vertical elements uh, that would be used for demarcation purposes and for uh, uh, transmitting information and identity, uh, horizontal sur uh, elements that would create shelter and surfaces for new programs, and enclosed programs, boxes that would house specific functional uh, elements ranging in size from little kiosks to big, uh, what we call pancake uh, buildings. So two of what will be the early stage interventions, uh, this uh, which is called Creek Landing, uh, on the waterfront here to create a kind of, uh, a, a kind of early stage uh, identity and center uh, for uh, the park and then uh, the concentration of recreational functions on uh, what's called the point here uh, showing the kind of current stage of that uh, aerial photograph we showed uh, earlier where you can see the way in which 
the landscape strategy is dominant. We continue to use this kind of linear vocabulary here, uh, but then developing a kind of architectural vocabulary here, actually a temporary visitor center um, where there's a kind of hybridization of that language of the, the horizontal of the roofs and the boxes to create a, a kind of visitor center and, and a kind of uh, overlook point uh, here. Um, also, trying to respect the, uh, or, or the uh, industrial past of the site and in fact using uh, some of the industri reusing some of the industrial structures on the site, uh, in this case for a visitor center and landfill museum, uh, using these big blue barns on the site and um, uh, organizing the program in layers that will uh, uh, replicate the stratification of the landfill itself so that the experience of moving up through uh, the landfill museum will give you a sense of the accumulation of those uh, layers in the landfill over time. This is the current state of the uh, proposal for that uh, uh, screen which will again be deployed in the early stages to protect these uh, methane gas flare stations uh, and then can serve in these early stages as a, a, a kind of canvas for a kind of, kind of graphic play that would have some of the kind of lushness and intensity, uh, a, a kind of anticipation of uh, that uh, uh, activity and landscape uh, to, uh, to come. Well, that's again, that's a project with a very long time horizon um, and um, involves this sort of commitment to something that uh, is, could, could take 20 years to, uh, to, to realize and it also has a correspondingly long uh, design frame. Um, I'm going to show just very, very quickly some other projects that happen much faster. This, uh, this is the Cuyahoga River, Cleveland, uh, Ohio. Um, the uh, river that in 1970 uh, caught fire uh, gave the United States the Environmental Protection Act. The river has been cleaned up. But the river's been cleaned up in part because all that heavy industry went away. It went to places like, uh, uh, like Brazil and, uh, and Japan. And consequently, there's now huge tracts of available land uh, very close to uh, downtown Cleveland. And we were asked by the city to look at what could be done long term uh, with that land and we proposed instead of a fixed master plan, this was actually just a kind of weekend charrette, a vocabulary of pathways, a menu of surfaces, and a series of scenarios about how those uh, surfaces and pathways might get uh, combined over time. And then we were asked back to look at this particular junction towards, the, uh, towards downtown, uh, where we plotted the way all those circulation routes might uh, uh, might converge to create a kind of density of activity on the site, uh, to reinvest it with programmatic activity, uh, insert the green space close to downtown, and to create a new kind of urban space that mixes uh, the architectural and uh, the landscape in close proximity to uh, uh, downtown. Uh, this was a project we did this spring for the Queen's Chamber of Commerce at the time when the, when the final location of the Jet Stadium was still up in the air and it was Queen's attempt to lure the uh, stadium to Queen's. Uh, LaGuardia Airport is over here, Shea Stadium as you can see here, Flushing Meadows Park, site of the 1934 and 1960, sorry, 39 and 64 World's Fairs. Um, but big tract of land here owned by the MTA and uh, some industrial territory here. So the proposal was to take over uh, that territory, uh, allowing the train yards to continue to operate and to create a new uh, commercial and landscape uh, development around the sort of anchor of the new uh, Jets and uh, Shea Stadium and a kind of commercial spine here. Again, a project done very, very quickly. Uh, but proposing a thick kind of mat of parking and architectural functions, 
a new landscape surface over that, and then the spine itself imagined as uh, a more densely occupied commercial uh, park. So here you see that sectional condition, the emergence into the waterfront park, uh, which would be here, uh, allowing Flushing Meadows Park to sort of finally come to the waterfront, and then the more sort of very explicitly sort of artificial park uh, that, that, that could get uh, deployed across the top of that uh, strip. Now, another project that mixes the, uh, I had a water somewhere. Well, no, don't worry about it. Um, uh, is the project for a uh, botanical garden for the University of Puerto Rico in, yes, that's it, yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, University of Puerto Rico in uh, San Juan. Uh, Again, another project where uh, James Corner's office, uh, Field Operations, is doing the landscape and master planning, and we're doing all of the architectural elements. <coughs> this is the site here, Old San Juan, Atlantic Ocean, uh, the, the, the beginning of the uh, mountains here, and this is the existing botanical garden, which forms part of a continuous green system university campus here. <coughs> uh, when you get down on the ground though, it's a pretty degraded uh, space. This is the sort of botanical garden proper where they have species and collections, uh, but uh, there are a lot of buildings here and as you can see, the site is divided by uh, this major roadway. So in a sense, the first job was to kind of again reimagine the site and uh, to think in very broad terms about different identities for the site, and then what would be the landscape, urbanistic, infrastructural consequences of those different uh, strategies. The scheme that's being developed is something close to this third one, the notion of a botanical uh, city. Um, and I won't go into detail in that other than to say uh, that it implies a sort of realization through phases beginning from uh, this sort of central uh, corridor here. Uh, our job was to create a, a, a series of working principles to develop the architectural uh, elements, again, working very closely with the landscape. The first thing we, the first thing we proposed is, the, is that the, the one thing that this site didn't need was more enclosed, freestanding, air-conditioned buildings. So we developed a uh, strategy of platforms, screens, and canopies. Uh, that archi architectural elements, structures that would, again, work with the landscape in very explicit uh, ways, but also would be phased over time and tied to the completion of certain infrastructures that were part of the larger uh, landscape plan. And of course, beginning from platforms, screens, and canopies, of course, many of them are sort of hybrids or uh, combinations uh, between those different uh, categories. So the very early stages um, really have to do with sort of announcing the identity of the site. And this large, lightweight piece, uh, which has a <coughs> giant sign on the highway uh, at the front, and then in the back uh, shades an existing uh, outdoor market would be one of the first elements to be built. A very lightweight, deployable, uh, temporary visitor center, and a series of lightweight roofs uh, with these towers that would house functions like restrooms and information centers uh, and start occupying uh, the site itself. Uh, the restoration of the river corridor becomes a really important uh, element of the landscape plan and that in turn triggers another series of architectural uh, interventions. Among them a pedestrian bridge. Uh, we had the notion that um, we could create structure by this wrapping, uh, that the, the, the sort of overlapped ribbons would essentially create truss-like forms, and by varying the spacing, uh, we could, would, could accommodate the different uh, structural forces. So you see this ribbon becomes very dense and creates the sort of structural configurations there in the center. Um, essentially an, an, an open tube uh, for the pedestrian bridge. 
uh, that's uh, deployed here to create a new entry adjacent to a uh, local transit station. And then finally, let's say the, 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 the most heavy duty infrastructure, the, the, the building of the kind of loop roads, which then allows us to occupy uh, further uh, into the site. So we designed a, a, a kind of a prefabricated roof structure um, that would be possible to accommodate uh, different sizes, different configurations, and different programs. Uh, it's simply based on the prefabricated uh, double T configuration used most typically in the US for parking garages. We take that, we turn that upside down, create a parallel structure based on the uh, standard lengths of that uh, that allows us to create a kind of roof landscape here uh, seen from the uh, local uh, train and uh, creating shelter for various programs uh, underneath. Um, a lightweight uh, band shell that's uh, located on the site of an existing band shell between these two uh, Guancaster's trees that uh, again takes almost a, a, a kind of light, intricate structure that has something to do with the, uh, the bamboo and the other uh, foliage on the site. Uh, a kind of, uh, at, at the crest of the hill, at the uh, southern end of the site, uh, a, kind of, a kind of earthwork building uh, which forms uh, a kind of viewing platform and galleries for an existing sculpture garden and uh, a view tower with a, with a look uh, back over uh, San Juan uh, in the distance. So those, those are large projects involving many different people, many different agents. Again, I talked about a different pace of work. I'm going to show very quickly a couple of little projects, including this one, um, which was a competition that, that Jim and I won just after um, Downsview uh, now completed a uh, little garden for the French Cultural Consulate on Fifth Avenue in New York City. And I, I show this in part because of the, in a sense, the sort of modesty of the project, which was also driven by budget, but also driven, but it was also part of our uh, strategy. That is to say, the desire not to make a kind of object in this space, but, but really to make a set of new surfaces, lighting that would, would actually activate uh, the existing space. It's very rare in Manhattan to have a mid-block empty space like this with complete uh, facades on both sides. So by simply making a kind of highly serviced uh, insertion in that space, we have the ability then to kind of activate uh, that existing space and create a kind of new uh, uh, urban space within the kind of uh, uh, facade of uh, Fifth Avenue there. Uh, another very quick, small-scale uh, tactical project. Um, we have a client uh, who is a developer in uh, Jersey City. Again, Lower Manhattan, the past station arrives here in Jersey City. This is becoming developed as a, as a residential neighborhood, but uh, they own this funny piece of uh, leftover infrastructure. Um, this was originally built to support a sky bridge that was going to connect across the street to an office building. Uh, this is where the PATH station, which is a local transit line, comes up. Uh, and the, the structure was uh, put in place, but the, but the sky bridge never happened. And it's always been a bit of a, an eyesore for them, a kind of white elephant. And they, they asked us, we're, we're trying to get a larger project from them, but they asked us to think about this a very cheap solution to do something with this uh, uh, piece of infrastructure that, that uh, now, of course, there are thousands of people moving through this space every day. So we propose that with a very simple uh, uh, canopy here, you could, you could arrange kiosks there and activate that space, uh, probably produce a little revenue, or you could have slightly more permanent kiosks. Uh, that would, would again create uh, a, a kind of active space in this currently unused space, or you could take advantage of the structure uh, to actually create a kind of second level uh, for a mezzanine uh, cafe. So the, again, this gets laid out as a kind of menu of choices uh, and the sort of envisioning of the nature of that space and the transformation uh, from this 
leftover piece of infrastructure to uh, a new piece of the kind of urban identity of that neighborhood. Now, this is a freestanding project, um, but I do include it under this umbrella of, of tactical projects because it's, it, 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 it's a project that's happening under somewhat exceptional circumstances. Um, this is something we've been asked to do. We're doing it actually on a pro bono basis for um, an organization in the Philippines uh, that takes care of handicapped children. They have this site, uh, they have a very modest budget and they've asked us to, to design a chapel. Uh, they said they, they can't pay us a design fee but they'll build whatever we draw. Um, and architects, we can't resist that. So, um, <laughs> but like the Convery House, we're dealing with very extreme climactic conditions and on top of that, the necessity of doing something that's very cheap and will be built without the, the ability to have site visits and supervision by uh, builders who are presumably not uh, in incredibly uh, sophisticated. So our solution is a big kind of, a kind of concrete, almost infrastructural scale roof, uh, which will shelter the site, and then a very lightweight, almost furniture scaled piece uh, that will uh, enclose and protect uh, the church itself. And then, of course, uh, uh, simply a kind, of, a kind of modified ground because uh, m many of the children are in wheelchairs and uh, need the sort of free access to that space. So here's the plan where you, 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 you see the, 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 the enclosed space of the chapel itself and then the creation of a kind of uh, uh, public spaces uh, around that would be very open to uh, the, the uh, community around it here view of the interior where you get the, the, the juxtaposition of the, the, the heavy rough roof and the more delicate uh, work of the, of the screen. Uh, the way in which the geometry of that roof is uh, both uh, a very inexpensive way of dealing with seismic uh, uh, loads uh, and the big fold of the roof to channel uh, both to accommodate these, these two existing trees on site maybe a bit uh, naive to think that we can actually keep those trees, but we'd like to. And then, of course, feeding all of the runoff into uh, a garden in the back where that uh, existing palm are. And then here, the unfolded elevation of the screen, the way it relates to the different programs behind it, um, sort of reference to some of the traditional uh, uh, iconography, uh, of course, of the church. Uh, and the, the, the view of the chapel uh, at night. All right, one more project, um, which in, in a sense, uh, if I use this subtitle, Objects and Fields, at the beginning of the lecture, is a kind of uh, uh, effort to, um, to synthesize the freestanding object building with the kind of continuity of the field through this notion of a kind of figured field uh, or an events landscape. Interesting. Uh, wireless mouse seems to be, yeah. Oh, huh, okay, well, wireless mouse has died. Uh, uh, one, one last project in any event, but this is not the project I'm going to show but was a, uh, the, the earliest version of this idea, which was developed as a visitor center for the uh, botanical garden. The clients changed their mind, decided they didn't want a visitor center. Um, but we had taken a sort of shot at this notion of creating a kind of occupiable landscape. Uh, all of these landscape forms would house different functions, the conference center, uh, the visitor center and the cafe, um, yet, uh, and they would also serve as a kind of landscape that you could walk over and on to get up to uh, this large uh, roof. Well, when we were asked by the mayor of the city of Taichung in uh, Taiwan, this is a context that Patrick knows well, um, we, uh, for various reasons, wanted to return to that strategy of, of what we ca were calling a kind of landform uh, building. Taichung is a city in uh, Taiwan about an hour uh, south of Taipei, will be joined uh, by a high-speed railway, which will terminate here. And for that reason, um, this uh, 
program was uh, proposed for uh, this, this site adjacent to the high-speed uh, railway station. Um, now, what's interesting about, well, um, what's interesting about the program, and I think this happens more and more in contemporary practice, is that clients or agencies, uh, city officials will come to you with a, pro with a program, but they don't really know what that program is. In this case, they had this notion of a contemporary music center. They had a budget. Uh, they knew that the contemporary music center should include an outdoor amphitheater for 18,000 people, but they didn't really know what else should be part of that. And a large part of our work as architects was, in a sense, filling out their program, reconceptualizing their program, inventing um, a, a new kind of institution that would be more active than this uh, simple uh, outdoor amphitheater that would, would be empty most of the time, the sort of monofunctional character of a program uh, like that. This is the site. It's a rice paddy landscape. This is not a delicate uh, wetland that needs to be protected. Uh, rice paddy landscape is a is an artificial landscape to begin with. But there was something about the dead flat and an amazing sort of artificial green character of this that if we, if we started thinking about sort of shaping an, an, an outdoor amphitheater would then require the creation of this kind of artificial landscape that would allow us to, to create the outdoor amphitheater and then serve uh, as a base for the uh, architectural elements on top. This is the larger uh, landscape plan. Here you can see the high-speed railway station and the connections immediately there. And this is just a little bit of the work that we did in this attempt to, to sort of recontextualize, reconceptualize the program for the clients to introduce, in addition to their performance functions, these R&D functions and exhibition functions on the site. Um, so these are some of the program elements. The idea there's no single precedent for an institution like this. So we, we looked at a whole series of precedents and sort of sampled those programs, mixed them up together to create this sort of new program. Here's the program itself. Um, and the idea that that process of sort of sampling and mixing, of course, is exactly how contemporary music is produced, uh, contemporary pop music is produced uh, today. So that the, the, the center itself would, would kind of parallel, parallel the dynamic ecology of that kind of uh, industry. So this is the basic programmatic layout, the big kind of shaped landscape to create the outdoor amphitheater, and then uh, the bridge piece to form a kind of gateway there, and the uh, library and data center, R&D, uh, and uh, exhibition, uh, in a sense, the sort of uh, you know, rock and roll hall of fame of Taiwan, whichever, whatever that might uh, mean. Uh, this, is the, this is the final site plan. Uh, you can see the way in which the access works here. Now, of course, uh, those mounds are occupied with architectural space, in part a kind of concourse and platform of parking, which is entered by those two routes. And then once you're in the system, you move up uh, through it. Uh, here's a, a view of one of the study models uh, where you see that uh, outdoor amphitheater concert hall embedded here and um, these sort of new landscape spaces. Uh, here's the lowest level moving up through where you begin to develop the foyers and the public spaces that feed people into uh, the big open space here, uh, the concert hall at the next level up, uh, the site here where we bring the landscape up in here to create spaces here, uh, and uh, the profile of the amphitheater itself, the view of that terraced area, which when it's not in use as an amphitheater, simply e exists as a kind of uh, uh, landscape space within the city. And then within the bridge itself, um, the, the more open floor uh, that's used uh, for exhibitions, and then the more cellular uh, landscape up above of sound studios and uh, laboratories, the tower for administration, the roof garden here, and the view uh, looking towards the north uh, of the sort of public entry 
uh, with the stage and the artificial landscape uh, beyond. View of that in section. Again, you can see the way in which these mounds are uh, constructed mounds, not artificial, uh, not, not natural mounds, uh, view of the model. But really the point of the project is this, that uh, getting, getting beyond the kind of monofunctionalism of something like simply an amphitheater by overlaying multiple functions, multiple event venues to try and activate this space uh, both uh, more months of the year, more hours of the day, to really, really make it a kind of active uh, public space uh, within the city, not something sort of partitioned off uh, from the city. So that, 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 that somehow with the, the deployment of, let's say, the traditional expertise of the architect that has tended to be directed at the kind of freestanding objects and the strategies that you can borrow from landscape architecture, from ecology that have to do with surfaces and events and activities and the natural and the social ecologies, you have this potential, hopefully, uh, to create new public spaces within the city. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take some questions. I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Thanks for coming. See you. Thank you, Stan. Uh, we get lights. She'll bring them up. Oh, okay. Should we start with some questions? Does anybody want to start? Just let them get settled for a minute. <coughs> Hi, um, very eloquent presentation. Uh, very nice to, to follow. And um, I was just... Uh, Regarding the last project why, uh, and your argumentation about it, I was wondering, since you've really the result is very much a kind of set of two discrete elements, no? Where, where I was wondering if uh, wh where is that coming from, or if you have if you see any potential for for bringing them more closely mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. or yeah, I, you're yeah. you're you're absolutely correct, and and I think it's a fair criticism of the project and. Um, uh, that, uh, again, represents a fairly, uh, it, was a, it was a sort of five-week period of work in which we generated this project ver very, very quickly. Um, um, by the way, that project was done in the, um, in the spring of 2004. Um, that's, an, that's important um, if um, people in my office point out pointed out the uncanny resemblance of the section of MVRDV's uh, museum in Taiwan. Um, as far as I know, they, they didn't know the project, but ours did precede theirs. But um, um, uh, anyway, to, to come back to your question, um, um, the project was, we'd been waiting since uh, spring of 2004 to see where it was going. Was there going to be government funding for these projects? They were supposedly going to be built. Um, and about a week ago, we actually heard from uh, the, the mayor of Taichung, who had originally hired us, uh, that he's proposing to move forward, but on a different site. Uh, and I think that absolutely, the right now, the, the, the landscape and the architecture are in sort of two different realms, and they're touching. And uh, that uh, as we go forward with the project to get the landscape and the architecture to interact much more will, will absolutely be sort of an agenda of the, of the project. Yeah, thank you very much for a very nice presentation. But I was curious about 
Uh, the second slide you showed with the exchange, the, the, the interstate exchange, the diagram of the architectural office, and then the position of the projects compared to that. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting that you chose uh, uh, an inter interstate exchange that separates all the layers and it's kind of recognized that these things are a kind of modernist mm -hmm. um, approach to well, infrastructural planning or it's things that separate away from each other sectionally and so forth and that, that certainly goes throughout most of the projects particularly this last one um, but is there a way that architects could could engage with the the merging of what you're what you're hoping was the landscape coming through the architecture in, uh, in, a, in, in let's say, a, a more practical way in which the practice became something less of um, a separate agenda or, or yeah. a kind of, uh, yeah, a, a cellular or, or mm -hmm. central object, but became part of that part of that sure. merged landscape. L look, I mean, I think I think your uh, your question is is absolutely to the point. I mean, I I would say that in many ways the the, the most urgent issue for sort of sort of architectural uh, discussion one of the most urgent issues for architectural discussion today is precisely that it's not so much um, the you know the formal character of the work as uh, the uh, rethinking of the, the structure of practice and the consequences that that might ultimately have uh, for for the, the, the formal and uh, and conceptual character of the work itself. Um, you know, ar architects uh, are remarkably resistant to uh, changing the way they work. We, we still work through just, you know, incredibly, you know, in, in a certain sense, kind of old-fashioned, quaint kind of, kind of ways. Uh, you know, I'm thinking all aspects of it. I mean, you know, in terms of like even let's say the sort of, sort of financial and organizational structure, relationships to clients, you, you know, um, and uh, it, it, it certainly, uh, I, I suspect it's happening in Europe and in the UK. I know it's happening in the US. Some of the most interesting younger practices are doing precisely that. Um, that they're, in, uh, on the one hand, they're much more sort of entrepreneurial in the way that they've restructured their relationships with clients and with commissioning agencies. Uh, certainly, digital technologies have had a big impact on this. I mean, the the ability for the architect to control the means of production through CNC and so on, and to bypass uh, traditional forms of working drawings and so on. I think in the next couple of decades, these are where the really important innovations are, 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 are going to occur. Um, we've, I mean, I'm in a sense a, a sort of interesting case in point though, having, having entered into a, 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 an interdisciplinary collaboration that was in a sense, uh, unique in that um, uh, the, the working relationship with Jim Corner was was a working relationship that where architecture and landscape architecture were were equal, not the traditional relationship where the uh, architect is the is the lead and the landscape architect is is o o often often thought of as, uh, as as secondary. Now, ironically, through in part. Our, our own kind of confrontation with uh, the bureaucracies of implementation and, and, and so on, we have stepped back into much more conventional disciplinary lines where, where, where Jim is functioning more and more like a traditional landscape architect, I'm functioning more and more like a traditional architect. So, uh, you know, if that's a, I, I wouldn't want to necessarily call it a failed experiment, but in a sense what that shows is how Resistant those structures are to to, to change. So um, I, I guess I guess the best way to say it is that the that that notion of architecture ex as a new form of architectural practice existing within this kind of web uh, uh, is 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 a kind of hope for the future. Uh, I, I also used the term uh, design intelligence, which comes from uh, Michael Speaks. Um, I think one of the things which is interesting about Speaks's formulation is that it, it suggests, for me at least, the notion of design intelligence suggests on the one hand that there is a specific architectural expertise uh, that has to do with visual intelligence, with the ability to use certain media, uh, with a knowledge of our own history and so on. Yet that 
exists in relationship to this broader intelligence, which, like all intelligence today, it's, 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 it's no longer a problem of access to information. It's a problem of, of organizing that information and understanding within the kind of vast array of information that's available today what information is really, is re really important. So uh, I think that notion that as architects we need to, we need to kind of sort through uh, the, 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 the information and, and, and understand how it can be uh, relevant to our own practices becomes a really, really urgent uh, issue today for working and thinking. Yeah. Um, the, the, the question I want to ask in a way is so kind of simple that it's difficult uh, to quite find kind of words for it, which is this, that, that if you take the kind of your kind of joint kind of reaction to the sights mm -hmm. that we've seen mm -hmm. this evening, the sights are characterized for the most part, but, but not all, by being in some way kind of inherited. And yeah. they, they might be thought yeah. at one level as quite difficult sites, but they're, they're the consequence of having been used or inhabited in one way or another, mm. and that that mm -hmm. use mm -hmm. in one way or another has been withdrawn. Nonetheless, there seems to be a certain, however difficult, to collaboration, yeah, yeah. however James might be. You know, th there's a certain logic uh, about the way in which you combine landscape and purely architectural sure. kind of issues. So do you find in that combination a kind of identity of practice which in some sense becomes independent of inheriting mm -hmm. a certain mm -hmm. type sure, of sure. site? Sure, sure, yeah. And I think sort of somehow for me the answer to that you know, which was in some sense, yes, uh, was actually kind of most clearly given in the example of the French <laughs> yeah. constitution. You know what I mean? yeah. Because there, there yeah. you had it sort yeah. of condensed. Sure, sure. And in some sense, unnecessary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's really it. <laughs> well, I, actually, I mean, I appreciate that. I, it's and uh, you know, obviously, I mean, people have tried to give names to this practice. I mean, <laughs> landscape urbanism seems to be one which has, and I think you know, I mean, it's 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 it is an important uh, attempt to give a kind of identity to this to this new 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 practice. Um, I, I guess one one way of thinking about it that's been useful for for me is is to think about landscapes and sites uh, as, as uh, having embedded information. And um, that uh, rather than, let's say, thinking about the pathways and the topographies of Central Park in terms of the history of landscape architecture or, in, uh, uh, or um, the picturesque or so on, just to, to think about Central Park as a, as, as a landscape with a certain amount of embedded information. And what's interesting is that then that information can be used by different people in different ways. And I, I think that was a little bit the thinking, I mean, the little garden for the consulate was in fact right across from Central Park. And this was a little bit the dilemma of the, of the competition. How do you do a landscape space you know, across from Central <laughs> Park? And you know, the, the, and, uh, but the idea was that, that you, you, as a designer, one of the things you determine is how much information and how much specificity that information has. So it still allows that sort of openness that allows other people to sort of come in and recontextualize it. So, and and in, in, and the answer in the in the cultural consulate was, you don't need to do very much. New surfaces, services, lighting. And that allows that other transformation to happen. And it also leaves it open. That's a little bit that sort of notion of the loose fit. It leaves it open for the appropriation by other people. So. Yeah. I want to pick up on this notion of strategies and tactics, but also reflect a little bit, perhaps critically, on the, your presentation and how you present and project for yourself, sure. um, having not seen you for a few years. And it makes me think about 
the question of a career strategy hmm. and how this notion of tactics could be dangerous of allowing you to be kind of purely reactive and opportunistic with respect to uh, commissions and sure. you know, we all know that the difficulty o uh, of constructing a career which is guided by a manifesto, and I would put manifesto or mm -hmm. uh, purposes or primary hypothesis as a headline, and you have that he those headlines in a way, and then there might be strategies of implementation, and then there are tactics of, of, of maintaining that strategy, sure. Which sure. Is, and still there's the overarching headline, and I thought since I lost it a little bit when I was when you showed these houses, and I said, "What is he doing? What is he trying to project himself at?" Also, you haven't mentioned Princeton at all, and how this ties in, and that you take this on, and yet here you present yourself as only the architect and show some houses which don't follow the headlines. So, I congratulate you this last project, which is a fabulous opportunity, and it is very strong. And um, I noticed that yes, your collaboration with James Cohen has a you know, a manifesto title, which is Field Operations, so mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that of course obviously that allowed you to, to come in and do some interesting uh, uh, in, uh, field projects. And this for me becomes most interesting when these field projects become more architectural, more immediate, instead of being out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And my sense was, well, the houses, why are they shown and how do they fit in? And maybe that's something which we all do because we pick up everything and, and, and shouldn't be here. And also sometimes I felt, uh, let's say, what I don't like about the tactical, the way this becomes uh, something where, uh, uh, is maybe something where manifestos are in the end brought in the mainstream are uh, uh, plowed through and it's also happening. But when we present here and, and we, when we claim a, a, a territory as, as avant-garde and manifestos, I think it's better to be rooted and bloody minded in yeah. pushing through hypotheses and driving them uh, and not being overly, re um, let's say, respectful to lots sure of sure. conditions, sure sure. because that waters yeah. them down and the yeah. tactics is to, to get everybody to, 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 to compromise themselves, to allow this hypothesis to to live to a certain extent, let's say. Yeah. And I felt sometimes that in some of the projects, <laughs> yeah, yeah, not yeah. all of them, there is a yeah. there is a weakness, in, in, in of of stamina with respect to the pushing the manifesto through a strategy and employing tactics yeah, yeah. and just celebrating tactics and what is left is sometimes a little bit. Yeah. So what? Yeah. Well, uh, I have I have this one. I have this one. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, look, it's a it's a fair criticism. Uh, I mean, but I guess I'm a little I'm a little um, I'm, I'm trying to understand the tone of it, which which is which is you know sort of friendly advice. I could I could do a better job of claiming a certain territory, and I you're you're absolutely right. I could probably better sell the project of the sort of landscape urbanism and and landform buildings as, you know, in a sense, a kind of identity for, th for the practice. Um, the reality is it's just not what we do day to day. And partly what I think is interesting about lecturing in this context and, and why the sort of working through the notion of the, the, the tactical and the strategic is I what I showed you is a pretty accurate reflection of all the stuff that happens in the office. Now, maybe we shouldn't, you know, show our dirty laundry in public, but, you know, again, it's, it's a friendly environment and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a chance to, you know, to hear that, 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 that kind, of, uh, kind of feedback. So, but I, you know, architectural practice is a messy business and rather than clean it up for public consumption and present that sort of immaculate identity, I, I think it's part of the working process to just show the things that actually don't fit and and you're you know you're right. I mean it's so. Um, that's my response. Yeah. Uh, within academia. So you talked tonight about the practice of architecture sure, sure. and the collaborations. Yeah. Yeah. How about the relationship between architectural practice? Well, it's, I mean, it's, you know, it, it informs really everything I do. And 
I mean, I, I, I will say this. I never would have gotten to the, all of that work and the discussion around uh, field conditions. All of that was worked out in projects in the studios at Columbia in the 1990s. I mean, Andrew Benjamin knows this very well. Um, that I think, I think any of us who take teaching seriously see the architectural studio as a kind of laboratory where you're working with the students to work out these ideas. Uh, I mean, I first did a studio on field conditions at Columbia, I think in like 1994 or 1995. So, um, I mean, you know, the answer is, I don't know, I didn't talk about it in a sense because it's so deeply embedded in the work that, um, uh, that during the 13 years I taught at Columbia, of course, I taught all exclusively uh, upper level studios. Um, so there was a lot of opportunity to, uh, to, to do that kind of you know, studio as a kind of laboratory uh, work. I'm obviously in a different role now. And one of the things I like about Princeton is it's small enough that I do teach. Um, but interestingly enough, I teach, um, I teach the first year graduate studio, uh, which in, an, in American graduate schools, in many cases, you're actually teaching people with no architectural background. So um, that's actually. I, mean, I haven't thought about this, but I think a little bit that notion that because I'm now in a position where I'm essentially introducing students to the discipline of architecture, it's in some ways provoked me to think a little bit more carefully about the tools of the discipline itself and the expertise uh, uh, of design. So, so the two things have happened in a kind of parallel uh, course. I'm wondering if, uh, in what seemed, in a very useful map of strategies versus tactics and the way it rethinks, let's say, planning and performance, or the planned and the performative, if one way to connect those two would be through questions of tools and techniques. And I guess the question it, it raised for me was, was what are the lessons on, from your part, uh, from your position of the way in which those might transfer across. I think one clear distinction we could say is one of scale. It's mm -hmm. a scalar leap. Sure, sure. In fact, it's presented as a scalar. Yeah. Yeah. Small projects, monster yeah. projects. And I yeah. had a chance to see some of the great student work a few years ago in, a studio, in your studio at Columbia that was kind of half the size of the Midwest in the States. And <laughs> I was like, what would these poor guys do with the building? And right. You know. Now, one of the things that popped up tonight seemed very interesting was that at least two of those houses have suddenly had an addition mm -hmm. up here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this idea of seeding a project or a diagram is yeah. something that, for example, has yeah. been thought through at a very large scale yeah. and even presented tonight. Sure, it would sure. be another way to sure, think sure. through this relationship. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, you know, I guess the, the, the interesting question there for me is do you, do you look for a kind of um, conceptual construct that will work at multiple scales, or are there ideas that are scale specific? Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I tend to think there are ideas that are scale specific, that, that I, I happen to think this whole discussion about field conditions has been very productive, but I wouldn't propose it as a kind of working principle for a single family house. Uh, I don't think, you, 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 you don't have the internal programmatic complexity, you don't have the, the physical extent. Now. I don't know, maybe that's a blind spot on my part, but I, I think there are ideas that are scale specific. It's one of the reasons why I sort of stress this notion that there, there, there you, you know, for a practice to be robust, it, it actually can't be hung on a single idea. I think it always has to be uh, operating with, 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 with multiple work, working principles. So, um, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it is, has been interesting to work to revisit these two projects. Um, I'm not sure I would make a, a strong theoretical claim for that, though. <laughs> Any other questions? I think we'll stop there. Stan, All right. thanks very Thank much. Thank you very much. <laughs>